Well, good morning and welcome to the program today. We just praise the Lord and are honored to be with you. Appreciate you joining us and we appreciate what the Lord is doing in your life and in the lives of those that we know and whom we have seen God just turn their life around. And, you know, he's that kind of God. He's the God of second chances and he is the God of third and fourth chances and he just delights to minister to his people and as you as a woman of God he has a plan and a purpose for your life you may be seeking his face to find out what that plan and that purpose is let me just encourage you don't grow weary and well-doing whatever you're doing right now God's got a purpose for that wherever you're at he's got a purpose for you being there and he will direct you and he will certainly lead you in the way that he wants you to go and he will open those doors and he will encourage and strengthen you you're going to find times when you're going to grow weary you're going to find times when you're going to feel downhearted but those are the times when you're just going to have to trust his will and trust his word and know that he's got a plan for you and we just want to encourage you this morning to just allow him to minister to you today and we would like to hear from you and and if you want to contact us you can do so by reaching me at lynn t ministries at aol.com and i'd like to connect with you if you have something you would like to share and a testimony you feel would minister to somebody connect with me there or find us on facebook with defining moments at radio station and uh, send me a comment and let me know, hey, I have something I feel that will minister, and I will talk with you, and we will share and set up a time, and let me hear your story and see if, if that's, you know, what the Lord has planned for you, and to come on here and to share with others. You know, I always like to say, the test is about us, and the testimony is about somebody else, that you can tell them that when they're in the midst of their storm, what God did for you in the midst of yours, and it will help them endure. It will help them as they struggle. It will encourage them to keep going and to know that if the Lord be for us, who or what can be against us, that no weapon that, pros that, no weapon that forms against us can prosper. Now that lets me know that weapons are going to form. Things are going to come against us. But I also know the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he said when we have a walk with him and these weapons form against us, then they're not going to be able to prosper. They may look like they are, but he will prove himself God in the midst of our storm. And he will walk with us and he will help us and bring us comfort and bring us peace and bring us direction. And in that dark cold night of your storm or your process he will speak ever so sweetly and he will minister to you right where you are and so i just want to encourage you to call up a friend this morning and and have them join us i have a beautiful guest with me today and she and her husband have certainly been through the storm they have walked through a, a trying time and you know i use that word walked through uh rather i don't use it lightly today because there was the possibility that one of them might not walk one of them you know might not survive but the lord had other plans and i know that everything the enemy means for evil god can turn it around and make something good if we'll just dare to trust him and believe his word and i know you've heard some powerful testimonies this year on this program and this will be no exception and I just want to welcome Ann Wisnett and her husband, Jim, to Defining Moments today. They're, uh, Jim pastored for 20 years, as, and um, they like to call their testimony Strength Made Perfect in Weakness. And as I said, Jim pastored for 20 years as an Assembly of God minister, and 15 of those years he ministered right here in the state of Alabama. And then Jim became a prison chaplain and was at MS State Penitentiary for 17 years. And while he was doing that, Ann worked as a nurse for 31 years. And after retiring in December of 2011, they moved to Clanton, Alabama. 
And um, in December, Jim decided he'd try his hand at something else. And he wanted to be a truck driver. So he began to drive 18 wheelers across country. And every two weeks, Ann would go with him and they would see the countryside. And I just let me add that they are both ordained Assembly of God ministers. And uh, they are doing a work for the Lord even now. And having struggled and come through what they've come through, the Lord has just proven himself more and more to be God in their life. Now, as I said, Jim began driving a big rig. And um, he was sharing with me earlier how that it was in January of 2013 that he um, began to drive the truck alone without a uh, trainer there with him. And he began to go out on his runs. But on uh, a Saturday during uh, 2013, maybe like 12 weeks into his new career, their story took a turn. Their life took a turn. And with that, I want to invite Ann to join me today. And Ann, just let me say welcome to Defining Moments, and thank you for coming to share yours and Jim's story today. Well, thank you, Lynn. I appreciate you having us. Uh, we were had just dropped a load off in Detroit, Michigan, about 5.30 that Saturday morning, and we're headed out of town. It had been snowing, and there was icy slush on the roads. We were on I-94, and we pulled off on the side of an own ramp for Jim to put some information into his computer to the company. And as we pulled off, we saw over to the left in the medium a car that had apparently slid off the road due to the ice, and there was a man standing down beside it. And up on the shoulder of the road, there was another car, and a lady was standing there. And Jim said, as we pulled to a stop, he said, well, I don't think she's going to be able to pull him out of there. I, I don't know if I could use my truck. And I said, no, no, honey, I don't think so. He said, I, I, I guess I, I couldn't. So he began putting in his information in the computer, and when he finished, he almost started to leave. And he looked out there again at them standing there, and he said, you know, at least I could offer them help. So he said, I'll be right back. He gets out of the truck, walks across or kind of ran across the three lanes of traffic on our side, and uh, I jumped over in his seat and thought about following him, and then I thought, no, no telling how long he'll be there, and it's cold out there. I saw him nod to the lady saw him get to the other side of the road, and I get back over in my seat on the other side of the truck. I no sooner got settled into my seat than I heard a horrible sound. I looked up, and I saw a black car in the air and debris flying everywhere, and I heard a woman screaming, and I jumped back over into his seat and looked out the window, and I no longer saw him there. And I no longer saw that car there. And the thought went through my mind, he may have been hit. I thought, well, no, he probably ran and got out of the way somewhere. So I got out. And as I was crossing the road, I said, Lord, give me strength for whatever I'm about to face. And as I got to the other side of the road, there was now another car sitting diagonal on down the way and a man came from around the end of it and he was very upset he was saying my babies my babies and I said did you have babies in the car are they okay I knew some kind of accident had happened but I, I didn't realize what and he said I don't know I don't know but his wife came around the other end of the car, and she said the babies are okay he said oh thank God thank God he said that man I said, that man? He said, that man standing here. And I said, that man that was standing here was my husband. And he grabbed me and started crying and said, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. And I patted his back, and my heart just went out to him. I said, I know. I know you didn't mean to. It's okay. And I got away from him. And I went around the end of his car, and I found Jim 
laying in a pool of blood. His wife had covered up Jim from the waist down with a blanket from their car. And as Lynn said, I was a nurse for 31 years. I've seen several people die. And I honestly thought Jim was taking his last breath, every breath that he took. He had blood coming from his mouth, from his ears. His eyes were set. And there was blood all around him. And I took out my phone. I called our son in Dallas, told him his dad had been hit to pray and pray hard. Somebody was saying, call 911. And I thought, well, surely somebody else has called. But they said it again. So I called 911, told him where we were, asked somebody there exactly where we were. And we knew no one there. We'd never been to Michigan before. And so I still heard that woman screaming. And I thought to myself, I can't believe I'm so calm. But I realized that there was a presence there. And it was the presence of God. And so I answered the questions of the EMT people that came. They loaded Jim up. And I was in the front seat. And I heard them calling the hospital given report and they said among other things they said his left leg is two-thirds amputated so I called my sister in Clanton Alabama and told her what had happened ask her to pray and have people pray and when we got to the hospital of course they told me that they would get back with me as soon as they could but it was going to be a while and so I went and tried to find a place to plug my cell phone up where I could start calling family. I called his brother in Virginia. I called other family. And then I'd been there about two hours when they said that the surgeon wanted to talk to me. And he took me in a little room and he told me that um, they were going to take Jim to surgery. And he said, right now we have got to concentrate on saving his life. We can't save his leg. It would take too long, and it's his breathing and his lungs that we're concerned with right now. I said, I understand. So they took him to surgery, and he told me to go to the second floor surgical waiting room and tell him my name at the desk. So when I walked in and told him my name and got my sticker, when I turned around, there was this elderly couple that came up and said, introduced themselves and said so you're with Jim Jim Whisna and I said yes but now like I said we knew nobody up there and I thought they had the wrong person and they said we we know Sam and Rachel and I said who and they said we know Sam and Rachel and I realized they were talking about Jim's brother Samson and his daughter Rachel down in Hakoda Alabama Mm -hmm. at a children's camp that they've lived and worked there for many many years and I said oh yes and they said we're friends of Sampson's and he called us and asked us to come and that and then by the time they got through talking there were five other people that walked up from two different assembly of God churches there and they didn't know who they were looking for but they said yes we were told about you too and we're here to do whatever you need and that was the beginning of what we called our Michigan angels and they multiplied we ended up being there a total of 81 days and these people that God sent us total strangers they went to the airport picked up my son later one of them picked up my daughter they offered their homes to us when our families were up there they brought us food They prayed with us, cried with us, took me to town, bought me clothes. They did everything that anybody needed. But And the pastor, Trey Hancock, was out of town right then, but he had sent his associate. When he got back in town the next day, he went to visit Jim. And him and Jim became like Jonathan and David every day while we were there except for a few days when he was going on a missions trip Trey came at least once sometimes twice a day and just talked with Jim listened to him prayed together cried together come to find out Trey been up there 20 some years but he's originally from Birmingham and um, 
we've become fast friends with him and many of the others. But the first 48 hours, they would they didn't give us any hope for Jim. They they said he's it's touch and go, touch and go. And they said we we don't know and then they told us at one point we've done everything we can. We're just waiting for his body to respond. They said he had had a crushing type accident. He was hit by a car going 60 miles an hour and he was broken up from head to toe and um, his back was broke and many other bones and punctured lung. Let me let me stop you right there just a second and, and I want you to make clear that he wasn't in a vehicle when he was hit at 60 miles an hour. Right. His body was literally hit and pinned between the two vehicles. Did you not say that he went into the the windshield of the car? Yes, we later were given by our lawyer the police department pictures and uh, we saw the windshield and his blood on it and the watch band that he had had on on the inside on the dashboard of the man's car and he went through the window and back and then someone told us that he one of the witnesses that he flew through the air and landed several feet down the road so here you got your husband that's just stepped out of your his truck walked across six lanes of, of or three lanes of highway to the other uh, side of the interstate he's been hit by a car going 60 miles an hour physically thrown through the air and you have this piece yes it was just totally God and I, so many people have said during that time and since I've been home and especially after we ended up being up there as long as we were oh I know that was just so terrible Oh, that's just the most horrible thing. And, you know, I would almost agree with these people. And then I'd catch myself because, and I'd say, well, you know, it was bad. But it wasn't as bad as it could have been. And I had peace. And God gave me calm and strength. And it wasn't me. I mean, I'm a big crybaby. <laughs> and some people I felt like thought I didn't love my husband. But I did. And it hurt to see him hurt. But it was just a God thing. He gave me that strength. He gave me that peace. And on Wednesday, after his accident on Saturday, I fell down steps and broke my left foot. Oh, no. And I was in a walking cast for seven weeks. Mm. And uh, now, the second day after his accident, he was on the ventilator. And I asked one of the trauma surgeons, I said, how long do you think it'll be before he's able to be flown back to a hospital in Alabama? And he kind of leaned up against the wall and said, lady, I can't say. I, I said, but I just need a ballpark idea. Everybody's asking me back home. He said, well, if he makes it, maybe it's going to be several weeks, maybe two months, and then he'll have to be air flighted back. I said, okay, I understand, I understand. Well, in three weeks from the day of his accident, there were three trauma doctors standing at the foot of his bed and said, you're ready to go to rehab. Wow. The doctors and the nurses were blown away by how fast his pro progress was. But they kept saying those first 48 hours, he's not out of the woods yet. He's not out of the woods yet. One day at a time, I said, I understand, I understand. And as I would walk in to see him, and he was swollen and he, you know, just, he was bandaged up everywhere, and his eyes were fixed. And, of course, he was in a sedation, uh, an induced coma, because they said he, they couldn't afford to let him move because they didn't know what all was broken, but he wasn't stable enough to do a body scan, take him downstairs to do a body scan. And when I would look at him, I had the thoughts go through my mind, you know, he may be paralyzed. He may never speak again. I may be taking care of him for the rest of my life, and he may be a vegetable, but that never, you know, just, I can't say it overwhelmed me. The thoughts went through my mind, but I just felt that peace, and I felt that calm. And then when uh, I was talking to my son on that next morning, I told him, I said, Jimothy, 
so many people, literally hundreds of people on Facebook, on the phone, had called and they had told me they were praying and I knew and I told Jimothy, I said, we have been living on other people's prayers. But, you know, I've got to go find a place, and I've got some things i got to talk to God about. He said, okay, Mama. I said, I don't want to go to the chapel. I'm afraid they'll come give us an update, and that was downstairs. So I went in the ICU waiting room, went over in the corner. And um, about four months before that, our home pastor had asked me to preach a sermon about what to tell people when they've gotten news of a tragedy like your cancer's back and there's no hope. I dealt with things like if the doctor tells you, I'm sorry, we've done all we can and we couldn't save your child. Or your husband walks in and says, I'm sorry, um, I don't want to live with you anymore. You know, I want a divorce. What do you tell people like that? And I had said, my answer was, You've got to lay it all on the table with no strings attached. To have peace, to have victory, you've got to say, God, I'm yours. Everything I am, everything I've got. And you've and I had sang a song and had said, whatever it takes to draw me closer. Mine and Jim's desire through the years has been to glorify God's name. And since he had left the prison from being chaplain, which really was not his choice at that time, we kind of felt like we'd been put on the shelf. I believe it's a ministry taking care of my parents, and we minister where God opens the door, but we were just felt like, God, what are we doing right now? And so I went into that waiting room and got down on my knees, and I felt like that some voice was saying, D did you mean that? Did you really mean that? And I said, God, I did mean that. And whatever happens, if Jim lives or if he dies, I just want your name to be glorified in my life and in his life. And I know that you are the healer and you can bring him through. Mm -hmm. But I still lay it on the altar, no strings attached, whatever you want, God. That so was, um, a defining moment right there. Definitely. It was a defining moment. And um, there were times that uh, I, I've had to continually, you know, uh, re, um, redo that. I can't think of the right word I'm looking for. But then when, um, after I went back and I would see Jim in ICU, I can't tell you how elated we were when my son went in on that second day. He came out, he said, Mama, Daddy's squeezing my hand. Mm -hmm. And we knew, well, he had some movement. And then when my daughter flew in on Sunday night, we were in there, I think it was on Monday morning, and we started to leave the room. The three of us had been in there. And I think, again, my son, maybe my daughter said, Mama, Daddy's following you with his eyes. Just those little things. Mm -hmm. Let us know. Hey, neurologically, he is still in there. Mm -hmm. He is still with us. And so... It, on day five, they said, we're going to try to take him off the ventilator. We don't know if he can breathe on his own, but we're going to try to. And I asked everybody that I could to pray. I've seen people when they take the sedation away and the pain that they can be in. And he was so broken up. I said, please just pray that he won't be in severe pain. And God answered that prayer. When he came off the ventilator, he did not appear to be in pain hardly at all for the next couple of days and did he come off the ventilator after five days of being on life support he came off yes praise he did God. and they didn't have to put him back on well, praise the Lord. at all and no pain and no pain at that time no struggling the lord just no. intervened there wow well, let me tell you this story just gets better and better uh as we say in the south it gets gooder and gooder yeah <laughs> <laughs> wow and i know that this was a, a trying time, but I know who you ran to, that the Lord was your strong tower, not just yours. And I know that your husband's going through this, but um, he's asleep. You know, he's in this induced coma, 
and you're awake with all your senses and you're having to deal with all these emotions you're having to deal like you said a while ago uh, dealing with the fact maybe people even wondered why you were so desensitized to this situation but isn't it wonderful how the Lord can just kind of let us step out of our own personality sometime and he just takes over definitely so that we can be focused so that we can pray I know there's going to be a part two to this but today there's a somebody listening today that they're they're struggling they're going through something maybe it's um a life or death situation maybe they've gotten this word uh you know uh the cancer's back or we got to look for more we've got to do this just just speak a word of encouragement into that man or woman's life today because you've been there and i like what you said no matter what god i give it to you take just a minute and just speak to that person. I just like to say that God is enough. He is enough in every situation, and He'll meet you wherever you're at. It's easier if you make the choice before the tragedy comes mm -hmm. that you are going to be totally sold out to God no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what happened with me. But even if you're going through a terrible thing right now, you can still say, God, here I am. I'm giving myself all to you. And he will give you what you need to see you through. Amen. Well said. And it's so wonderful to know him as our father and be able to do that. Now, if you're listening to this program today and you're a pastor or a women's director or you're looking for somebody to come and share a word with your people, an encouraging testimony, then I want to encourage you to contact uh, Jim and Ann Wisnett. Uh, you can do that by sending them an email to annwisnett at yahoo.com or you can contact me at lynntministries at aol.com and uh, we'll get you connected. These are anointed, uh, an anointed couple that can speak into your life and Next week, Jim's going to join us. We're going to let some of these men come on this program that have had some defining moments back here. And I was thinking about Jim and his personality and how he, when he came into the station, he was teasing with our DJ. And um, when she said that he might be a vegetable, well, if he was, he would have been a chili pepper. <laughs> <laughs> because he is on fire for the Lord and for his ministry and what God is doing in his, li his and his wife's life today. So thank you for joining us. Tune in again next week for part two. And remember this, out of everything you've heard us say today, when you realize just how much Jesus loves you and you give your life to him, then you will experience your greatest defining moment. <laughs>